completely blunt here, Brian, and there are plans to expand indoctrination. That's right. Well, Idahoans are also concerned. Horror shot. That line would be moving a little bit farther west. I'm like crying. Nobody wants to Dark see. Dark money is influencing policy in our state. Well, that's not how this works. Once again, welcome to Nowhere to Hide. I'm Brian Hyde, and my job isn't to tell you what to think, but I am going to encourage you strongly to think a little bit harder about uh, the content that you consume, whether it comes from legacy media sources, whether it comes from me or any other source. Let's just face it, there's a lot of uh, dis, mal, and misinformation out there. And uh, if you're not on your toes, there's a very good chance you're going to be deceived. And I'll give you some really good examples of this. And actually, I'm going to share with you uh, some very helpful tools for recognizing the, the more subtle ways. It's, you know, it's not, I wish it was as easy as, well, you know, the, uh, the corporate media is just going to tell you big, bold lies that anybody would be able to recognize. But it's more subtle than that. So uh, I guess uh, maybe the first thing to keep in mind is, we, we think of this in, in political terms often, but this is not as much a political war as a psychological war and one in which uh, you are being conditioned to lean or to look or to believe a certain way without actually having the burden of someone proving to you that this is factual and that's why you should embrace it. So with that in mind. Let's dive right in, shall we? Thanks to the Idaho Capital Sun for reminding us that, uh, you know, since it's uh, it's Pride Month, uh, the White House is stepping up to name a coordinator to push back against what they call book bans and new LGBTQ protections. They want to actually promote those new LGBTQ uh, protections. And the Federal Department of Health and Human Services will also be issuing what they call evidence-based guidance to mental health providers who work with transgender youth. A government department jumping into bed with medicine. I'm sure that would work out very well. I mean, after all, with the COVID response, there were never any problems there. All the evidence the experts gave us absolutely panned out, right? Now, if your sarcasm detector didn't start emitting showers of sparks and burst into flames, you might want to get it recalibrated because, yeah, there, there's there's a lot of problems here. But let's, let's dive into the issue at hand. The Idaho Capital Sun says that there are book bans. Now, we don't really understand well, what kind of books. They'll tell us, well, it's uh, things like Catcher in the Rye or it's things like Tom Sawyer. Books which, you know, for some, some people may be unacceptable. But in the first place, we're not really talking about banning books so much as establishing, is it appropriate for books such as this one, Gender Queer, to be available to kids in the school library or, for that matter, in the public library? Now, of course, uh, the good woke answer would be, well, of course, why, why would anybody see anything wrong with that? Well, as a parent, Maybe I just don't want my kids being stripped of what remains of their innocence before it's time. But there are a lot of, there's a lot of activism, and, and invariably, it always seems to come back to some book that's challenging the norms of right and wrong, appropriate and inappropriate, or for that matter, real versus imaginary. So yeah, parents, you, you definitely have a stake in this matter, but not to worry. The Biden administration is going to make sure there's pushback from the federal level to make sure that uh, these, uh, these activists who want to get books like Gender Queer into your kids' hands are able to do so without your pesky interference. All right, back to the article. As part of the celebration of Pride Month, the Biden administration on Thursday announced several new protections for LGBTQ plus youth and families, including the position of a federal coordinator to counter what they're calling a massive wave of book bans across the country. Now, again, I have to point this out, and I'm sorry if this seems pedantic. Nobody's banning these books. If you want to buy these books, if you want to purchase them yourself, they are readily available, and, and there is going to be no problem, no interference, no legal consequence whatsoever. This is simply a matter of people, pr primarily parents, drawing the line and saying this book is inappropriate to be in the space where, where children are going to learn and read and study and use their imaginations. Give them a chance to get a little bit older, and if they want to seek out that material, it will still be there. Nobody is banning books. But, of course, you know, words mean things, and what we're supposed to draw from this is, but they are. They're just trying to erase their existence. It gets better. The celebration comes as more than 550 now, they call them anti-LGBTQ plus bills have been introduced in state legislatures in 83 passed this year across the U.S. On Wednesday, for example, Missouri Governor Mike Parson signed legislation that bans minors from beginning gender affirming care. That would be surgical mutilation, cutting off healthy body parts or taking uh, transforming uh, uh, hormones that, that cannot be reversed and limits sports participation for transgender athletes. 
So a biologically born male will not be in there wrestling against your natural born daughter. I don't know why, but they have to spin it to make it sound like, oh, this is so unfair. How could this possibly be? Now, by by labeling it as anti-LGBTQ plus bills, of course, this is to, to help promote the narrative that, well, you know, somehow this is picking on a very marginalized community that, that just, you know, nobody even knows about, much less accepts. And it's it's really, truly unfair why hardly anybody's even heard about it. Why probably, you know, if somebody hadn't told you, if they had, if the Idol Capital Sun hadn't said so in their article, you wouldn't even have known it was Pride Month, would you? Okay, again, sarcasm detector, you might want to put that outside before it starts a fire. During a call with reporters on Wednesday night, senior administration officials said a new coordinator on book bans, <laughs> they're not bans, has not yet been named, unless, of course, they're planning on banning books like the Bible or bl- banning books that promote a uh, more traditional viewpoint. But uh, anyway, an individual will be part of the Department of Education Office for Civil Rights. Now, the coordinator will be tasked with training school districts and advising them that book bans that target a specific community and create a hostile school environment may violate federal civil rights laws. So in other words, they're going to be threatened with court action if they make these books unavailable to kids, not banned, but uh, place them off limits, you know, and put them in places where older kids or adults alone can access them. Something that needs to be understood here too, when we talk about civil rights versus rights, like natural rights, you have to keep in mind that natural rights are what limit government's power over you. Natural rights are what keep us free. They're what keep government from interfering in our lives. What we call civil rights, which somehow is held up as like almost a a holy sacrament of our civic religion, They don't protect your rights, and they don't limit government power over you. In fact, what civil rights do, and in this case, this would be exactly the case, they increase your obligations to government. You will do this or else. Now, some people say, but it's the only way that people will be fair. I disagree. And yes, that means that most of the civil rights legislation, I believe, was entirely unnecessary. Why? Because people have a tendency to sort things out for themselves. When you force them to associate or you force them to bake the cake, so to speak, or force them to make, you know, lurid material available to their kids, do you really convince them? That's not the point, is it? It's not about convincing people. It's about you will do this or else. And that kind of coercion only only promotes more resentment. It promotes uh, more anger and alienation. So, you know, don't be surprised when parents show up and start pushing back hard, like we saw Armenian American parents do in uh, the Glendale School District in California earlier this week. It's a distinction a lot of people don't really know about. But again, civil rights are not the same thing as natural rights. One limits government's power over you. The other increases your obligations. The article goes on to say in the last few years, there has been what they call an unprecedented wave of bans spurred by parents and conservative groups to target books that center the LGBTQ community, black history and diverse stories. Okay, but let's let's talk about those books for a moment. If those books, when they say center the LGBTQ plus community, are they recruitment aids? Are they technical manuals? for how to better enjoy masturbation, better enjoy oral and anal sex? Are they books that distort history and try to teach uh, communist theories of of criticality in which uh, everything is oppressor versus oppression and, and basically subvert the idea that we all have individual rights, we all deserve to be seen equally before the law? Because that's a problem. And books like that, we should approach with great caution, and especially if someone is trying to put them into our school district. But when they talk about this unprecedented wave of bans, can I just ask, has there not also been an unprecedented wave of LGBTQ plus uh, so-called anti-racist activism and just general left-wing nonsense that's been foisted upon our kids in the name of diversity, equity, and inclusion? See, I don't think this is about correcting wrongs. I think this is about trying to shape young minds and give them correct opinions and correct ideas and ideals so that they know, you know, what, what's expected of them. And yes, you know, that's, that's, by the way, an actual classroom picture of American students. Back in the day, that's how they saluted the American flag. After World War II, for some reason, that salute went away. I, I can't imagine why. All right, one more point here. Um, The article also notes that other LGBTQ plus support efforts have been announced by the Biden administration. And administration officials said the Department of Health and Human Services will also issue what they call 
And I love that they did put this in quotes. It needs to be in quotes. Evidence-based guidance to mental health providers who work with transgender youth. A move that comes as multiple states are banning health care access. And again, this needs to be explained. They're not banning health care access. They're banning permanent alterations and surgical and chemical mutilation of children who claim to be transgender. As far as adults, as, and as far as I know, those states are not banning adults who want to make that decision. The only thing they may have limited is uh, you can't access the taxpayer dollars to pay for your transition. But the officials did not disclose the details of the guidance. Well, if it's guidance and it's coming from government, you better believe there's a pretty big stick attached to it. And, and they're going to be using that to ensure that people comply. By the way, speaking of these marginalized groups that need defense from, from the rest of us who uh, are just don't want it forced on us or our kids. When you look at Rockefeller Plaza in New York City, would a marginalized group absolutely dominate the public space if they were a marginalized group? Seriously, think about it. I mean, it, this, this is so self-evident. There is nothing that's, that's uh, victimhood, you know, about these, these uh, groups, the LGBTQ plus groups. They don't have that mantle of victimhood that they once did. They're not only accepted, they are promoted, and in many cases, it's an enforced promotion, particularly when it gets into the schools and kids are not allowed to opt out of the mandatory instruction on these are the opinions, these are the attitudes you must hold. So can we at least stop pretending that we're dealing with poor, helpless little kittens who otherwise would be trampled underfoot by the meanies out there? The fact of the matter is there are parents out there who rightly need to draw lines, and there are people within the community who need to draw lines about what's appropriate and what isn't appropriate for the public space, particularly public spaces where children are involved. And if you have a problem with that, it's not a matter of, oh, the meanies all came out. For some reason, we, nobody can explain. They just came out and they wanted to, to take away all the fun. No, they got tired of people forcing this agenda on them and forcing it upon their children. And when they say no, of course, what's what's the first thing we do? We play victim. Oh, they're threatening violence. <laughs> they're victimizing me. They're they're uh, what's what's the word? They they refuse to validate me. <laughs> I'm sorry, but you don't need endless validation and affirmation from everybody every second of every day. Little something to think about. All right, let's give you an example too. Of uh, here's another nicely spun headline and. Uh, I don't know if I don't know if they understand the, the self-owned that they're engaging in here. This is from Idaho Reports. And nearly a year out, this is from the overturning of Roe v. Wade, no criminal abortion charges filed in Idaho. Well, how can that be? Weren't we told that basically we were we were immediately descending into a handmaid's tale kind of a society, a dystopian you uh, kind of uh, of of society where the women, you know, are nothing more than baby factories ruled over ruthlessly by the patriarchy and sent to jail if they don't do exactly what the men say. Huh. So how curious that uh, no criminal abortion charges filed in Idaho. Maybe it wasn't such a threat. Maybe it was just a whole lot of hoopla about uh, about nothing. But, you know, it's abortion for some reason is never, you know, a minor issue with the left. I don't know why. But if you cannot kill your children or your unborn children on demand anytime right up to the moment of birth, somehow that is seen as a huge affront to human decency. I don't quite understand it, but here's what the article talks about. As of May 31st, the Idaho court system had no record of any person being charged under the state's new criminal abortion statute. That's according to a data request from Idaho Reports. The case, or the law rather, Idaho Code 18-622, went into effect last August, overturning they're following the overturning of landmark case Roe v. Wade in 2020. Roe v. Wade, rather. In 2020, the Idaho legislature had passed the bill that would criminalize any physician who conducted an abortion in Idaho, with rare exceptions for reported rape, incest, and the life of the mother. That felony charge would be punishable by two to five years in prison. By the way, this is very much in keeping with what the law was prior to Roe v. Wade throughout Idaho's territorial history and even up through uh, up until 1973 after it became a state in 1890. The court system doesn't track how often civil litigation invokes specific laws, so Idaho Reports was unable to find data on whether the state's civil cause of action on abortion has been used since its implementation. 
Idaho did add exceptions to the law this year, clarifying some narrow medical exceptions that allow a physician to terminate a pregnancy. Now, these would include things like the removal of a dead, unborn child, the removal of an ectopic or molar pregnancy, or the treatment of a woman who is no longer pregnant. All of those exemptions are cases in which the pregnancy would never be viable. And nobody is arguing that uh, those shouldn't happen. Those, those are often cases that would actually involve the life of the mother. The problem I think that most of us have with uh, you know abortion on demand is that the vast majority of the cases really are about convenience. And it's about, whoops, somehow I got pregnant and now I don't want to deal with the consequences. I'll make it go away. That's what abortion on demand is primarily used for. The cases of rape or incest or legitimately, look, this is an ectopic pregnancy and we have to intervene in order to save the mother's life. That's, they happen, but they're very, very rare. Now, of course, to add to, to the sob story, uh, Minority Leader Re- Representative Ilana Rubel of Boise expressed concern about the abortion law, saying, we've been the fastest growing state, but I'm really concerned about whether we'll be able to maintain our status as an attractive destination and an attractive place for people to remain. Uh, because, you know, people gauge the attractiveness of a place on, well, now, do they let us kill our children or not? Please. That seems like a bit of a stretch. Rubel told Idaho Reports the state had only nine fetal maternal medical specialists for those very high risk pregnancies. We've lost four of them in the the last six months because of our abortion laws. Now, again, I'm going to question whether or not that was the actual case, or at least I'd like to see some proof. Because I know of places, hospitals, for instance, in smaller communities where they simply don't have the obstetric need or the gynecological needs. And so that's why these specialists have moved on and gone elsewhere where there was actual work and actual need for their specific service. It's not going to go away anytime soon. This is going to continue to be a flashpoint in, in the culture war, the war for, for America's soul, if you will. But it's, it's just so curious how uh, the, the left seems determined to equate, you know, the, the beauty and the desirability of a place to live isn't based upon our respect for life or on our, our economic freedom or our ability to live with freedom and not to be coerced and to, to you know, enjoy the blessings of the free market. No, it's, it's about, well, can I, can I escape the consequences of, you know, procreation whenever I want to? That sounds more like a, a society that is 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 committed toward uh, the, a hedonistic standard than than one that that actually is committed toward things that are based on the principles and practices of freedom, which involves self control. I'm sorry, I know that's an unpopular message, but self control is is one of the essential things. And and by the way, th- this idea that well, you know, we can't find that anybody was actually prosecuted, but it, you know, it doesn't stop. You know, other states had similar, very very strict abortion laws after Roe v. Wade fell. And so it doesn't stop a bit of mischief on the part of those who report on this. Check out this. Here's a report about a 24-year-old woman in Alabama was arrested and charged with a felony after she suffered a stillbirth. We told you this would be a consequence of abortion bans. Thank you, Twitter, for having community notes. Because there you learned that, well, she was actually charged with felony chemical endangerment after the stillborn baby tested positive for methamphetamine, amphetamines, and fentanyl. So it wasn't just a matter of, well, they were just denying her the opportunity to use her own body the way she wanted to. She was uh, she was negligent in a way that actually cost her unborn child its life. So, yeah, a little context makes a whole bunch of difference, don't you think? All right, moving on. This is uh, one of the tools that I'm going to introduce to you that I think you'll find very, I hope you'll find very useful when, when sorting out how media reports on a given event. I'm going to use Ukraine as an example simply because it is so hard to tell who is telling the truth. This is from moonofalabama.org. Um, I don't know much about this, this blogger other than uh, he appears to be a former military officer, but I really appreciate the distinction that's drawn here. Media will say things like one side says, that's the side they agree with, the side that they agree with, the other provides no evidence. And he gives some really powerful examples. The recent reporting on the conflict in Ukraine in Western media has uh, revealed a deceiving scheme in which baseless claims from Kiev are taken for granted while everything Moscow says, even when based on facts, is put into doubt. Let's show you what that looks like. So uh, White House dismisses ludicrous Russian claims, U.S. planned Kremlin drone strikes. This is from earlier last month. Ask about an accusation by the Kremlin spokesperson, Dmitry Peskov, that Washington had ordered Wednesday's strikes. John Kirby, the U.S. National Security Council spokesman, said, One thing I can tell you for certain is that the U.S. did not have any involvement with this incident, contrary to Mr. Peskov's lies, and that's just what they are. Okay, so that's what he said. 
Looks like they're they're not questioning a thing about it. He said this. There it is. Earlier on Thursday, Peskov claimed. See, there's a difference between said and claim. Well, he claims. You can almost hear a little sarcasm there that the U.S. had dictated the plan of what Russia said was a drone attack on the Kremlin intended to kill Vladimir Putin. Peskov did not provide any evidence to support the allegations. Okay, well, what evidence did uh, Mr. Kirby provide? Just asking. Is sauce for the goose, sauce for the gander? Or are we playing by a couple of different rules? Here's another one. This is a more recent story. Key Ukrainian dam blown up. Kiev blames Russia. Ukraine blamed Russia for explosions at a key dam which unleashed massive, massive flooding and threatened 80 settlements in what Kiev says is a last-ditch attempt to derail its counteroffensive. In a statement, Ukraine's Southern Operational Command said Russian occupation troops blew up the dam at Nova Kakova in the Kyrgyzstan region in eastern Ukraine. Now, the Russian-installed mayor of Nova Kakova, Vladimir Leontiev, denied allegations the dam had been sabotaged by the Kremlin's forces and claimed, there it is again, that, Ru- that Ukraine was responsible for the damage, according to Russian state media. Leont- Leontiev did not provide any evidence for his claims. Isn't that uh, just convenient, you know, that, uh, well, this side said, so we can probably take them at their word, but uh, this side claims and they didn't provide any evidence. We see this even in, in reporting and stories here in Idaho. There's, you know, well, they, they can't seem to show any evidence that CRT is being taught in the schools. Or that these books that are being promoted to kids have have lurid, you know, pictures and 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 graphic descriptions of sexual activity. They claim that. They say that it was there. Well, parents show up at the school board meeting or they show up at a, uh, a legislative hearing and say, let me read to you from the book. Oh, no, 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 no. We can't have that. Why? We have young people here serving as pages. And what, a, what an interesting double standard. So I, I wanted to share also a couple of excerpts from an article by uh, J.B. Shirk, who writes for AmericanThinker.com. You might have noticed that the word propaganda has been somewhat retired from polite conversation. Now, occasionally some state allied news corporation will apply the term to a public statement coming from inside Russia. But otherwise, the idea that governments promote falsehood cloaked as official truths has quietly disappeared. He goes on to say, instead, ordinary information enjoyed and shared among regular people is now targeted for classification. An alliance of national governments, international institutions, and propaganda engines described or disguised rather as disinterested nonprofits has sprung up to toss unacceptable thoughts into garbage piles for the mis, mal, and disinformation trash bins. As with everything else in modern society, the cult of expertise has even given us disinformation experts to decide what knowledge belongs where. You recognize some of this? Now, in this way, officials have flipped the script on propaganda. So rather than the people calling out governments for their lies, governments are preemptively defaming their citizens as liars. How do governments know when their citizens are lying? Well, easy. They just isolate anybody who contradicts publicly announced official truths. We saw this in spades during the COVID lockdowns and during the, the forcing of the vaccine on so many people. Like a puff of smoke vanishing in the wind, government propaganda disappears because anyone who recognizes it as such is guilty of spreading mis, mal, or dis information. Now, J.B. Shirk says to find out what is true, good citizens are expected to respect the authority of government disinformation specialists who target what the people say, but never what the government promotes. Again, that's very curious, as if somehow the government is above reproach, it's above questioning. Accordingly, government propaganda flows forcefully, yet invisibly, because nobody's allowed to call it what it is. J.B. Shirk says the liars have constructed a system in which only they may identify lies. And the question is, how long Americans will silently consent to any government dedicated to public deception? And that's, that's actually a very good question. Government monopolies over truth are evil. Because they elevate narratives over news. They protect the politicians' spin over facts. They champion the bureaucracy's needs over the public's. They preserve the state's power at the expense of the people's. Whenever governing authorities articulate uh, official truths, it means the actual truth is being smothered. And whenever governments claim the need to control information, that means that they're losing control over their citizenry. Propaganda and censorship are tools of the weak. They're the last resort of political systems no longer capable of successfully competing in the marketplace for ideas. 
How many times do we see that again in our in the homespun reporting here in Idaho? Have you ever seen a, a tax increase called out as well? Now we think that's foolhardy or that's that's expensive. When have you ever heard members of the corporate media here in Idaho call out a particular bill or a particular policy and say, is that something government should even be doing in the first place? It just doesn't happen. When it comes to the public school system, when it comes to school choice, well, you can have choice as long as it's within the government controlled system. Yeah, they run interference for those in power and do their very best to try to make whatever those officials say seem plausible and to try to, to debunk or at least, you know, smear or cast doubt on anyone who calls out the official misinformation. So what does that mean for you and me? It means we have our work cut out for us. Finding the truth is often, and in fact, for the most part, it really is. It's hard. It requires effort and it requires the ability to apply yourself and to think and to discern between fact and fiction. And that's not, it's not just some natural gift that you're born with. It's not like, you know, this touchstone, you touch it and it lights up. Oh, that must be true. You have to train yourself and order your thoughts and your thinking to where you can recognize when you're not being given complete enough information to make an informed call. Now, some people don't want to do that. Some people are just, let's face it, some are lazy. They would prefer to be spoon fed, whatever they're supposed to think. Okay, thank you. That's all I wanted was just you tell me what I need to think because it's, it's too hard. It's too much responsibility to try to come to that conclusion on their own. I suspect you're not one of those people, though. If you are a truth seeker, you've got to be willing to do the heavy lifting. You've got to be willing to sweat in order to get the truth. And all I can tell you is it's worth it because being deceived or being misled, even if there are noble intentions behind that to being misled, it sucks. It's being played. It turns you into a pawn on somebody else's chessboard. And frankly, you deserve much better than that. I think our, our goal is to be as unplayable on somebody else's chessboard as possible because we think for ourselves, we reason for ourselves, we make up our minds, and if necessary, withdraw our consent when people abuse that trust or abuse you know, the, the, the confidence that we have put in them to exercise government authority on our behalf. Which brings us back to the question, why do we have government in the first place? It's to keep us free. The purpose is to preserve our life, liberty, and property with which we pursue happiness. Somehow we've lost sight of that. It's a tool to punish our political enemies. It's a tool to give us everything that we want, everything that we deserve. It's a tool to right wrongs that we are in the process of creating. In other words, it's, it's a tool for power seekers and opportunists. And it's time we call it out as such. By the way, if you are in northern Idaho, I want you to put this on your calendar. You are invited to a town hall meeting with uh, Wayne Hoffman, president of the Idaho Freedom Foundation. This is coming up next Thursday, June 15th, 6 p.m. in Kellogg, Idaho. If you go to IdahoFreedom.org, you can find all the information that you need to, uh, to learn more about this. But I would strongly recommend, especially if you've been following the story about the uh, Kellogg uh, high school senior, you know, denied the opportunity to walk at graduation, the bus driver who stood up for him being fired from his job. If you're concerned about uh, the influence of, of woke activism taking place within institutions that are supposed to serve the public in a, in a dispassionate, neutral kind of fashion, I think you're going to appreciate what Wayne has to say. So mark it on your calendar, Thursday, June 15th, 6 p.m. in Kellogg. I hope that uh, you'll take the time to really study out the news articles and the news information that comes your way. And by the way, part of that means knowing when to pull the plug and say, okay, everything that I'm reading is either making me upset or it's making me scared or it's making me angry. If it's doing that, it's probably doing it by design. And that means somebody is toying with your emotions or trying to steer you in a particular direction. Don't be their puppet. Don't let other people manipulate you for their own purposes. Think for yourself, be willing to uh, disagree and be willing to find your own, you know, your own uh, facts from fiction and trust yourself. You can learn to think like an expert. You don't have to depend on some misinformation or disinformation specialist to tell you about what you're supposed to think. This is Nowhere to Hide. I'm Brian Hyde are biased, the Idaho Press Club are biased, all media, newspaper, radio. To be completely blunt here, Brian, and there are plans to expand indoctrination. That's right. Well, Idahoans are also concerned. Horror shot. That line would be moving a little bit farther west. I'm like crying. Nobody wants to Dark see. Dark money is influencing policy in our state. Well, that's not how this works.